All right. You may be seated. It is good to be here. I just drank a Red Bull, like, literally, like, uh, right before, because they were like, do you need anything? I'm like, yeah, I need a Red Bull. So they got me two. I think I got one for, like, when I finish. You want to go ahead and give me that? I'm going to drink it while I'm preaching. Go give me the one I'm supposed to have for later. I'm going to drink it now. So it's going to be, like, a, a two Red Bull message, and so you, like, get a double portion. Uh, man, I am I'm excited to be here. I'm telling you, like, I'm excited to be able to share God's Word, but let me tell you, as Pastor said, like, man, I really, like, I just adopted myself into your family. I absolutely love your pastors. And again, you probably hear this as you have pastors come up here and they preach and say, your pastors are awesome. But here's the deal, man. Like, I love the fact that you guys are the real deal. I mean, what you see is what you get. You love God. You're great parents. You got swag. You love your church. You're impacting the world. You know what I'm saying? And, and I just, man, just give them a hand clap for all that God has been doing in and through them. <laughs> Last time, man, and Pat, one thing about Bishop, I can't hang, because, like, man, we both like to shop, and so we go, like, man, it's like, we, we just always just shopping, and last time we were shopping, and we had the kids with us, and so Jaden, his daughter, right, my son's name is Jaden as well, and she let me know that Jaden is not a cool boy's name, you know what I'm saying, like, she's like, that is, that is not a cool boy's name, it's, it's a great girl's name, but it's not a cool boy's name, so anyway, I have uh, a little bit about me, I have two kids, uh, one is uh, Wesley, and he's 17 years old, he's a senior, and he's getting ready to go to college next year, which is crazy. I know some of you guys are like, really, man? You got a senior? That's right. You know what they say? Black don't crack. You know what I'm saying? Like, just fooling y'all thinking I'm looking young here. But, yeah, and then we have a 13-year-old, Jaden, uh, the cool boy's name. And so um, he's awesome. And so they're, like, in sports, and they're always doing something. But they're just great kids. And, and then my wife's name is LaKendra. And LaKendra is a bodybuilding competitor. And so, like, not like, I mean, like, she's, like, fine in a bodybuilder. Not, like, look like a man in bodybuilding. You know what I'm saying? Like, she's, like, but she just did, like, this competition recently. And, like, she won, like, a big deal in Oklahoma. It's, like, the largest show in the state, which qualified her to go to, like, national. So now she gets to go compete and potentially be a professional bodybuilder. So it's, like, so for the last, like, four months around our house, so we've been eating like, I'm just so sick of like fish and like broccoli. Like, and, and I try to be like nice to her and not eat crazy when I'm around her because, you know, she's got to eat like measured out stuff. So every time I leave, man, I'm eating turtles and Snickers and you know what I'm saying? Like chicken and waffles and I don't share it on social media. You know what I'm saying? But she's like, but it's good. And so um, here's what I, and first I'm just going to tell you guys off the bat, like I'm ADD, which means I have no idea what I'm going to say. But at the end of the night, one thing I can assure you is that it's all going to point towards Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. So, um, good. Uh, what was I saying? Okay, that's good. Um, uh, so, man, here I love this church because, like, as Pastor said, like, this is a cool church. Like, here's the deal. Church wasn't like this when I was growing up. I mean, I don't know about you guys. Like, how many of you guys raise your hand if your church wasn't like this when you are growing up? Here's the deal. Like, I remember I was, like, eight-year-old Scott. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm eight-year-old Scott. We didn't have, like, a cool kid's church. Like, I'm in church with my mom. You know what I'm saying? Like, the only thing you could do in church with your mom when you're, like, eight-year-old Scott is, like, draw and doodle on offering envelopes. You know what I'm saying? And so that's what I would do is I would sit there and, like, like my mom, like, man, I don't know what your parents fed you. My mom fed me, like, at least, like, maybe an old-school black candy, but, like, candy corns. That's like the worst candy ever. You know what I'm saying? Like, she would hand me some little candy corn and like circus peanuts. Some of you don't even know what that is. And man, you shouldn't know what it is. It's just sugar. Like, it's just sugar and they're orange. And so I'd be sitting there, young Scott, just doodling, eating circus peanuts and candy corn. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm sitting there doodling. I just eat like the little white part off the top of the candy corn. You know what I'm saying? Because you got to make it last. You don't just eat the whole thing. And so I'm doing that. And then, and I remember the preacher was like, he was always, like, mad and angry. You know what I'm saying? So the preacher was mad and angry, and he was always up there yelling. I'm like, and I'd be like, Mom, why is he so mad? She's like, just hush, boy. He's preaching. And so next thing you know, so he's up there, and I remember what his face said. You know, this is just a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. I'm like, well, send me to hell because this is, <laughs> this is long, and you're yelling, and you're mad. I thought Jesus was about love and nice, and anyway, so, and so anyway, um, that has nothing to do with the message whatsoever, but uh, what am I, oh, hey, um, real quick, I have a book, uh, a book that I wrote, uh, I preached here like a few times ago, I preached a message on Blind Bartimaeus, talking about drop it, and so what I did, I did a 21-day devotional on that, so, I mean, I think one of the boxes got lost shipping here, so I think I only have like one box that made it, but I'm going to be signing it afterwards, and they're like, 
It's, it's great. I promise you, if you read this, the first 21 days of the year, I promise you, your life and your family, your situation will be amazing. And if you don't, and if it, here's the money back guarantee. If you don't like it, just holler at Bishop. He'll give you your money back. And so um, <laughs> it's good. But, uh, but I have those out there. <laughs> I have those out there. It's good. Um, I'm just kind of looking. I'm a Thunder fan. That doesn't mean anything to anybody out here. I didn't expect it to. I'm just, again, I just, we're just, this is like, you know, here's the deal. One thing about, like, preaching is that, see, sometimes people, they just try to, try to get into things, like, really, really quick, and I don't think that's the way to do it. Here's the deal. I, I want to treat this like a, a good relationship. You know, we want to, we want to take it slow, and so, like, we're, we're not going to rush into anything right now. We're going we're to get there, but right now, we're just, uh, we're just easing in. We're just, uh, we're taking it, we're taking it slow. <laughs> Brother, they never drank a Red Bull. What's all that? Y'all, like I'm drinking liquor or something. They like, <laughs> like, nowhere in the world has anybody got that kind of response for somebody drinking a Red Bull. Like, <laughs> y'all ready? Y'all been drinking Red Bull? So anyway, um, uh, let's go ahead and go to our Heavenly Father in prayer before we dive in. Uh, Father, I just thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to share your word. God, I thank you for um, the opportunity to be able to stand on this platform, Lord, and I don't take it lightly. Uh, Lord, the best that I can do is to preach a general message that you've laid on my heart, but what you can do and the Holy Spirit can do is to come in this room right now and divide it hundreds of times so it speaks uniquely to the hearts of every single person that's under the sound of my voice, those from Australia, those from the hood, those from the suburbs, wherever you're from, God's going to speak something fresh to you tonight. I pray that this would put, I'm not done praying, I pray that this would, um, that Lord, that you would put an exclamation point on somebody's day and that you would put a period on somebody's week right now. We love you, we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen and amen, all right. It's good. So um, the time we're going to look at in Scripture is a time when Jesus had been performing miracles, right? So Jesus had been performing miracles, and because he'd been performing miracles, like, people like, you know, if you heard, like, like, like Jesus was showing up performing miracles, like, you want to see. Like, whether you needed a miracle in your life, you just want to see. You want to you wanna show up. You know what I mean? If somebody has a wreck on the side of the road, you want to see. That's why traffic is all backed up. Speaking of traffic in California, like, you know how much y'all's life you waste on those highways that begin with numbers? You know what I'm saying? Like, so, like, so, like, so he's sitting there. He's performing miracles. And we're going to pick up in Scripture, if you have your Bibles with you, you can open them up to Luke chapter 8. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the text in its entirety because some of you, this might be all that you hear. It's really all that you need to hear. So if you check out, I feel like that you've heard the message. And so I'm going to read this entirety. We'll go back and unpack it verse by verse. So again, we're going to do uh, Luke 8, and we're going to do verse 40 through 55. Here's what the Bible says. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him. For they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, the synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl about 12, everybody say about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Everybody say 12 years. 12 years. But no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people were crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in except for Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. 
Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed and chuckled and snickered at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. This is what we're looking at tonight. We're looking at a story of miracles and how Jesus showed up. And we think about it, when we look at the story of Jesus and all these miracles, like we try to imagine ourselves in there. We try to imagine our own situation and what are the things that we need to do in our life so our life can, can have these same sort of results that the woman known as the woman with the issue of blood and that Jairus and his daughter had. But the problem is, is that we're not connected to the same things that these folks were connected to in the Bible. The thing is, we're not connected, but we can be connected. It's, it's, it's like this, like, like my cell phone is, right now, if I look at it, it's, it's low right now. So my, my cell phone is dying. So what I need to do is, is I need to connect my cell phone. And so, like, if, if, I, if I need to connect my cell phone because I need to make sure that my cell phone is charged up, that my cell phone has power. And so, but the thing is, like, right now, I still can't connect my cell phone. So, at, at my house, I don't know if you guys do this, but we, we lose what we, we call it the pack, the little square thing. Matter of fact, does anybody have, does anybody have a pack, one of those little square white things? Any, any, any iPhone? Anybody got a pack? Where is that? Somebody got one? Anybody got a pack? Okay, you got a pack. Yeah, this thing right here. You see this right here? The, we call it a pack in my house. I don't know what you call it, but here's the thing. When we're talking about connecting to the power of Jesus, what we have to do is we have to, first thing we have to do is what? Is we have to connect to the pack. Because when we connect to the pack, and then next thing you know, we can connect into, and there's endless opportunities. There's endless opportunities for blessing and for breakthrough and for miracles and for your situation to look different. But the thing is, some of you are running around and, and you're trying to find a blessing and you're trying to find a breakthrough, but guess what? It's not going to happen. You know why? Because you're not connected to the pack. And so tonight you're going to learn how to connect to the pack. Everybody say connect to the pack. As a matter of fact, the, the title of tonight's message is stay connected to the pack. I want you to turn around to your neighbor right now and say, stay connected to the pack. Turn around to your other neighbor, the one that wasn't your first choice, the one that you don't really like, and, and turn around to them and say, stay connected to the pack. So, so Jairus was the synagogue leader. And, and his responsibility, what he would do is he would, he would say the big prayers, and he was the big dog, and he was the ruler, and he was the one that was held in high esteem. And so for him to, to go to Jesus, it means that he was in dire straits because he's the, he's the big dog. He, he's the big dog. And he's going, he's like, Jesus, I, I need you. And you think about it, that's oftentimes when we go to Jesus. It's when we're in dire straits and, and our situation is a little bleak. And so, so, so Jairus is saying, look, I don't care about my role. I don't care about who I am. I don't care about the pomp and pageantry. What I need at this moment is I need to go to Jesus. And then there was a woman who had been subject to bleeding. I mean, in, in the King James Version, they call her the woman with the issue of blood. You may have heard it that way if you've been growing up. And so this is a woman who was constantly bleeding. And basically, if I don't know how else to describe it, is that she would, she would bleed beyond her cycle. If it, for kids, if you have kids in here, I'm talking about a, a bicycle. Like, she would, anyway, so like she would... <laughs> A motorcycle, something like she would. <laughs> That's why y'all need to go to kids' church, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so she would bleed beyond her cycle, and she was considered unclean, and, and anything that she would touch would be unclean. If she, if she touched that chair right there, that chair would be unclean. And you think about this woman, and she, this, this is for 12 years. 
And you think about her situation with her and her husband. That's a pretty rough situation because she, she's unclean. She's considered unclean. I mean, it's a rough situation. And her situation is just getting worse and worse. And it, Dr. Oz can't do nothing about this situation. Like, like she's sitting there and what she's saying, like she knows that she's in a rough situation. She knows that she's in dire straits. But she continued to, to worsen and continued to get more anemic, and for 12 long years, she had been looking for answers. And the answers that she needed was found when she made the decision to do what? Connect to the pack. And so, I don't know if you guys know this, but you guys are celebrating 12 years of ministry. 12 years of ministry that destiny has been doing its thing and reaching people with the good news of Jesus. And, and tonight, as we're, as we're talking about, I'm thinking about this woman with the issue of blood for how many years? 12 years. And Jairus' daughter was how old? 12 years. And so as I'm thinking about th this number 12, and a lot of times we like, like, what do numbers mean? And I don't know if you know, like, biblically what number 12 means. And if you, if you wonder, like, what, what does number 12 mean? What, well, Scott, what does number 12 mean? What, what are the adjectives that describe number 12? I mean, you can go ahead and, and Google it. If you do research in the Bible, and what you will understand that 12, it means this. It means power. Yeah. It means authority. And it means completeness. And so when we're talking about connecting to the pack, we're talking about connecting to the power. And we're, we're talking about the authority, and we're talking about the completeness of Jesus. And so what we're talking about is, is Jesus is Pac-12. I, I mean, I know this is Pac-12 country, and I know for those of you that are, that are USC fans, and, and what you're trying to do is you're like, oh, we was just playing around at the beginning of the year. We was just messing around. It, it's not about how you start. It's about how you finish. And so you're, you're, feel <laughs> and so you're, 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 you're feeling kind of good right now. But we're not talking about that Pac-12. We're talking about connecting to Jesus' Pac-12. And so if you're taking notes, write this first thing down. The first thing is this, is you have to connect to the power of Jesus. Everybody say connect to the power. You got to connect to the power of Jesus. Verse 4, let's look at verse 40 again. Here's what the Bible says. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, the synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading for him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl that was how old, that was 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for how many years? For, for 12 years. But no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. And immediately, her bleeding stopped. You see, she knew that the only way that she was going to experience breakthrough, the only way that she was going to experience a miracle, the only way that she was going to experience a blessing is she had to connect to the power of Jesus. I want you to think about this. When it said that she touched the edge, the, the Bible is called the crespadon. So it was the, the tassel of his garment. So she just touched the very, very hem of his garment, and that's all she had. So she touched the hem of his garment. What she said is, is I need to reach out, and I need to connect to the power of Jesus. See, some of you guys... You, you, you want all that this pack can do, but you don't want to reach out and connect. You're, you're playing it safe. You, you don't even want to reach out your hands in worship. You, you don't want to reach out and tell your friend that, man, here's the deal. Like, I'm connecting to the power of Jesus. And so this woman said, I don't care what anybody says. I don't care how they've defined me. Because what's interesting about this story is you notice they don't even give her a name. They don't say Mary, who was bleeding. They don't say Sister Sally, who had a real bad blood situation. They don't say Sarah, who had been bleeding. They just simply called her the woman with the issue of blood. And see, what happens is, is if you don't learn to reach out and to connect to the pack, to connect to the power of Jesus, what's going to happen is, is you will start to let your circumstance and your situation define you. She's the woman with the issue of blood. Wow. How about so-and-so that she, you're Bob that cheats on his wife? You're so-and-so that used to be a stripper. 
You're so-and-so that cheats on your taxes. You're so-and-so the alcoholic. You're Jim that's a crackhead. You're Jim. What? You fill in the blank. But what happens is, is those things, those labels will start to define you. Jim who can never go to college. Bob who can't keep a job. Mary with cancer. And you will start to let those labels define you. And I'm telling you, labels, like, it's, so, it's something that's powerful about that, especially if you allow the wrong labels to come on you. I mean, I thought we saw a good illustration of this in this recent presidential election. Here's the deal. I'm, we're not talking about a candidate you vote. Don't get stressed. Don't get nervous because everybody's tripping right now on this election stuff. I'm going to tell you right now, nobody, it's just a, this is a peace zone. Nobody, don't be looking at me crazy. Don't be laughing. Don't be cheering. This is just an illustration that God's word wants me to connect to what we saw in this election. And so one of the things that, that Donald Trump was masterful at doing at his opponents, and what he did is he was able to put labels on them. If you think about it, what did he call Marco Rubio? He called him Little Marco. Little Marco. What did he call Ted Cruz? Lion Ted. I mean, what did he call Jeb Bush? Choke artist Jeb. And what did he call Hillary Clinton the entire campaign? Crooked Hillary. And so here's the thing. You remember those labels. And see, what happens is, is you don't realize it, but, but you start to kind of, they're subliminally thinking about that label. Am I crooked Hillary? Am I little Marco? And some of you, that's what you're doing right now. Like, you got some labels that some people have put on you that's not from God. And you're walking around and you're wearing those labels. And what God is saying is that's not who you are. But here's the deal. Like, for me, like with my sons, what I try to do is I try to put labels on them. I pray. Here's the deal. If your son is in the same grade as my son, he might be a world changer, but I pray that my son is going to be the most amazing world changer that ever lived in his age and his generation. So your, your son can be world changer number two. But I'm saying is this, is I speak those labels and those names over my kids. And so the question is, what are you allowing people to speak over your life? Bishop said earlier that the enemy is walking in front of you. He's walking in front of you like, really? Come on, man, please. You're going to go into full-time ministry? Oh, oh, yeah, somebody's going to marry you? Really? And you start to wear those labels. But you got to substitute those labels. You got to get rid of those labels and allow the labels. that Because God is the only one that can speak some labels over you that will last and that mean anything. And what are the labels that God speaks over you? You're amazing. You're awesome. You're beautiful. You went through a rough situation. You were molested, but that doesn't define you. I got something special for you. Yeah, all of your other relationships have been failure, but I got something amazing for you. I know your family's always been broke, but I'm about to show you some, some breakthrough and blessing financially. I just need you to be faithful. I just need you to be faithful. Don't allow them to define you. See, when you, when, you, when, you, when you want to connect to that power, that's when you'll see those blessings and breakthrough. You see, think about it. Like, God, I mean, God, imagine God right now. Like, God is on his way right now to either JFK or Eisenhower, maybe the Desert Regional Hospital, to perform a miracle on somebody right now. But while he was on his way to the hospital to perform that miracle, guess what? Do you realize that he can stop right here in Destiny Church and that he's going to perform a miracle on somebody's life right now tonight? Because that's what it is. Here's the deal. He was just on his way. He was on his way. The woman with the issue of blood reached out to him, miracle there. And then Jairus is saying, hey, what about my daughter? So he can be on his way to do something over there, but guess what? He can have something for you right here. So the second thing, if you're taking notes, is you have to submit to the authority of Jesus. Everybody say authority. Authority. Verse 45. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people were crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone from me. Then the woman, check this out, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, was trembling and and, and fell at his feet. In the presence, I don't care what everybody else thinks, he fell at his feet. Like this is a woman, think about it. This woman was considered unclean and she she fell at the feet of Jesus just trembling. And she, she just looked at him, looked at him and said, This is why I touched you. And 
instantly she had been healed. You see, some of you, you're rolling around in this thing called life, doing your own thing, and you're not really submitting to the authority of Jesus. Because here's the deal, a life that's obedient and submitted to the authority of Jesus is a life that's going to have endless potential and endless possibilities and endless opportunities for breakthroughs. Some of you, you want the breakthroughs, but you don't want to do what you're supposed to do to get them. I, I'm just kind of doing my thing. You know what I'm saying? I, I can go buy a Louis purse, but I can't tithe. I, 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 bought so, I bought some J's, but I drop a $20 bill in the offering bucket. I'm just saying. So you're talking about submitting to the authority of Jesus. I mean, we were listening to worship in the power of the name Jesus. There's no rival. Nothing compares to the name of Jesus, period, the end. And so when we understand that, that's when we understand, like, we can submit to the authority. And some of you are sitting there, you're trying to go unnoticed. But this woman with the issue of blood is telling you, you got to be noticed. You got to say, hey, here, here I am, here I am, Jesus. I'm here to put you on notice that you can't go unnoticed. Because you're not fooling God. God sees you. He knows when you're standing in the background. And so what it's about is saying, man, I'm going to come clean so I can become clean. Let me say that again. The woman with the issue of blood, she came clean like, hey, she could easily say that. Wasn't, I don't man, It wasn't me. Y'all lying. I didn't touch you, Jesus. But what she did was she came clean so she could become clean. And some of you tonight... You're going to come clean, and guess what? You're going to become clean, and God has something special and amazing for you. His name is powerful. I mean, we, we, there's, there's a lots of names for Jesus. One of them is I Am. And I Am alone deserves the reverence and awe that comes with the authority of the name Jesus. I mean, he says, I am that I am. It's one of the responses he used in in Hebrews Bible, if you think about it, if you, if, when he says this to Moses, asked him in Exodus, he's talking about like, I am that I am. I am now. I am tomorrow. I'm in the future. I'm past, future, present. I am that I am. And that's important for us. Like, he, it never changes. And that's important for me. As I've been walking this journey, trying to figure this thing out, I just look back to step after step, and it was about me stepping to and saying, I have to submit to the authority of Jesus. I mean, think about it, like, when we, like, when we teach our kids to introduce themselves to, to people when they're very young, and like, you're like, hey, what is your name? And like, your kid will say, hey, hi, I am, and you say your name. Matter of fact, I want everybody to say, I'm, you're going to say, I am, and I want everybody to say their name. You're going to do it in unison. You're going to say, I am, and then say your name. We're on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. I am. Okay, so I don't know what everybody said. I hope everybody said your own name and not anybody else's. But as I was thinking about submitting to the uh, authority of Jesus and the power of his name, I was reminded of something. His name is so powerful, I can't even tell anybody else what my name is without saying his name first. I am Scott. I am Obed. I am Mary. I am Billy. Here's the, do you think that, do you think God is surprised about this revelation? I'm sitting there thinking like, here's the deal. I am, insert your name. He was trying to put us on notice that you're running around talking about who you are, but guess what? You're going to understand the authority that's represented in my name. I am, you can be whoever it is that you want to, but you fall on the authority of Jesus. Jesus deserves for us to submit to his authority. And I'm thinking about my own life and when I finally had to realize, like, who I am is. You know, I, I don't have the, the little clean church boy story. My, my oldest son is Scott Wesley Williams, Jr. He was in our wedding. You know what I'm saying? I'm just keeping it 100. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I know some of y'all trying to figure it out, trying to do the math. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? But here's, as I, as I look back, what I love about Wesley, so we call him Wesley. What I love about his story was 
is when he was brought into this world, that's when I truly, I've been saved, but that's when I truly submitted to the authority of I am. I could say I am Scott because I knew who Jesus was. And it was from that moment on. So here, like when people ask like, when did your story change? I can tell you every single time, it's when Wesley was born. Here's the, his birthday's in May, it's May 12th, and that's when the game, 18 years that I've been rocking this thing for real. And here's the thing, so I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what your story is. Yeah, I'm Scott that was shacking and had a baby out of wedlock, but guess what? God said, when you learn to submit to the authority of I am, I got something to make for you. So it's not a matter of where you've been. It's a matter of where you're going. Like, where are you going? Third point, if you're taking notes, is this. You have to trust in the completeness of Jesus. I don't know if you guys knew this, but this was a little bit of alliteration. You know what I'm saying? The power, the authority, and the completeness of Jesus. We're talking about Jesus, Pack 12. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about connecting to the pack. And the completeness is the most important. We're thinking about this, and we're thinking about faith. I mean, I'm talking about some Australia type of faith. I'm talking when you're sitting here, and you're thinking about, like, what does this even look like in my life? Verse 48. Then he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. And this is the point in the sermon where someone will come play on the keys and make me sound a whole lot more spiritual to make everything I say (laughs) just preach a whole lot better. (laughs) And here in a moment... This is what the preacher says as I close. So um, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and start point three over again. Point three is this, if you're taking notes. You have to trust in the completeness of Jesus. Verse 48. (laughs) Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except for Peter and John and James and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned. And at once, she stood up. See, we talk about the completeness of Jesus. We're talking about faith. When we finally say, God, I trust you, because this is the hardest one. It's one thing we want to reach out and connect to the power. And man, this reverence, but like to really trust God with everything. And that's what we're learning in the scripture. That's what we got to do is we have to trust God. Because completeness is the faith that God is going to show up. And your situation is going to blow up. And that's what God, he just wants to show up in your situation. And he wants to blow up your situation. And you know what it is that you're facing. You know what it is that you're dealing with. You see, the Bible speaks of three types of faith. Little faith, God can do this. Great faith, God will do this. And perfect faith, it's as good as done. So the thing is, do you have this perfect faith to say, God, I know it's as good as done. I know that you're going to show up and show out. And that's what you have to know, and that's what you have to believe. As a matter of fact, if you guys would, would you put verse 50 up again? I I want us to relook at this. We got verse 50 up again. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, what? Don't be afraid. Hold up. Semicolon. Just what? 
Just believe. In other words, you, man, it's as good as done. And she will be healed. You see, the semicolon is I'm looking in my Bible and I'm looking in the notes of semicolon. It's a very, like, it's an interesting piece of punctuation. It's been around since the 1400s. And as we think about the, the, the semicolon, like it was fathered by a printer. His name was Aldous Matanuas. And, and this quirky little punctuation, again, it's been around since the late 1400s. And it appeared in, in great literature, and, and, and now it separates our, our friends' names in an in a email when we're trying to send an email to them. And it's like this, before we had the emojis, we used the, the semicolon as this whimsical emoticon, just kind of almost like a little bit of a wink. And so the, the semicolon has been around for a long time. And, and who would have thought that, that this little piece of punctuation that came in 1494 would, would make it all the way till today? Well, we shouldn't be surprised. You know why? Because if you look at the semicolon and what it's used for, it makes sense because the original point of it coming into the world, that the semicolon, what it did is it applied when a sentence, you might have thought it was going to end, but the sentence continued on. So instead of closing the thought, the author went forward with additional ideas. You see, God uses semicolons freely in our story. You see, some of you, you, you thought the story was over, but God's saying, your story isn't over. Semicolon, I got a breakthrough. Yes, you used to be broke. Semicolon, you are got the year blessing. Yes, you was molested. Semicolon, I got a blessing for you. Yes, you've been addicted to drugs. Semicolon, I got something around the corner. Yes, you couldn't stand church. I got a church that's going to open your eyes to a whole new dimension. Yes, my son or daughter is far from God. Semicolon, they're about to come back to the Lord. Yes, 2016 was a ridiculous year. It was a bad year. Semicolon, but 2017, you're about to experience blessing and breakthrough. Yes, my health is bad. Semicolon, I got something for you because God uses semicolons and saying, you think this story's over. Oh no, semicolon, I got something for you. And some of you are saying, you know what? You know what? I, this is just a story of my life. I always got problems. Let me tell you this. If that's just a story of your life, it's time that you get a new author. Because when God is the one authoring your story, your story of your life isn't going to be a negative one. When you connect to the pack, that's when you're going to see blessing and breakthrough. So instead of regretting where you've been, you can give thanks to where you're going. Instead of being upset about your past, you can get excited about your future because your pain is about to be your platform. Your setbacks are about to be your setup. And your humiliation is going to turn into some domination for the goodness and the glory of God. But you got to believe it. And some of you, today is the day that you're going to connect to the pack for the very first time. And see, here's what happened. When we look at the woman with the issue of blood, everybody's seen her diagnosis. She was bleeding for 12 long years. While they saw diagnosis, Jesus saw prognosis. And see, what you got to understand is the prognosis is he said I got a plan for you I got something amazing for you some of you you're walking around holding on to all this stuff and tonight's the night that you're going to connect to the pack and when you connect to the pack I'm telling you blessing is about to come through because here's the deal there's blessing on the other side of your belief and we're looking at this number 12 that represents power authority and completeness a 12-year-old ministry out here in Indio, California, reaching people all around the world. A 12-year-old little girl who they thought was dead, but Jesus said, she's just sleeping. 12 years, a woman was bleeding. 12 disciples was all he needed because that was the number of completeness. Twelve pearly gates in heaven. Twelve tribes of Israel. And if you look in the Bible, you talk about this number of completeness. Now, isn't it interesting that the first account of Jesus ever speaking words in the Bible, we found in Luke 2, verse 42 through 51. And guess how old Jesus was in this account? You just go look it up. I can't make this stuff up. He was 12 years old, and he was stepping into the completeness of all that he was going to be. And guess what? You're about to go into 2017. Guess how many months there are in 2017? 
There's 12, and that's the number of completeness. You're about to step into it. You're about to connect to the pack, and God is about to experience blessing and breakthrough. The number 12 is found 187 times in God's Word. Is it interesting that 187 is the California penal code for murder? You see, the enemy is trying to, he, he, as Bishop said, he's walking in front. Of, he wants to murder your dreams. But what God is trying to say is what he said to try to destroy you, to try to kill your dreams. I'm telling you this, you're about to connect to the pack, the power, the authority, and the completeness of God and blessing and breakthrough. And you can tell the enemy, you can tell 187, you can tell all of them to get behind you because God has something for you. And you're going to step into it right now. And I'm going to close with this. The moral of the story is this. Jairus' daughter, Jesus said this to her and he's saying it to you. He said it to the people. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. You know that business deal that you're worried, oh, I thought it was going to fall through. It's not dead. It was just sleeping. You wanting to, to lose weight and get healthy and everybody can't be done because you've had some setbacks? It's not dead. It's just sleeping. You're trying to find Mr. or Mrs. Right and you don't know if you can do it. It's not dead. It's just sleeping. You're toying around with a lifestyle that you know is not from God and you're saying, I want to be delivered from this and you're saying, I can't. It's not dead. It's just sleeping. You want to step into full-time ministry, but, but you got one foot in and one foot out, and, and you're saying, there's no way that I can do it. It's not dead. It's just sleeping. You're about to go reach all of this valley with the good news of Jesus as Destiny Church continues to expand, and you're thinking about it. You're wondering if it's going to happen. Guess what? It's not dead. It's just sleeping. Being healed from cancer. Oh, I, I thought I was going to be healed. I thought I was going to get a transplant. I thought my family member was going to get healed. There's no way it's going to happen. The doctors are not giving us. So the, the diagnosis is bad. Breakthrough is not dead. It's just sleeping. It's just sleeping. 